thank you to Green Links and thank you for coming um, tonight. Uh, my, my brief is to uh, talk about what I would say growing numbers of us in uh, the business community believe once we study what's happening in international energy policy is going to be the next great energy crisis and if we're right uh, we hope we're wrong, but if we're right, it's going to happen on our watch within the next few years. So I'll seek to uh, actually basically interest you in this issue. I, I think it's very difficult to persuade people in a 30-minute uh, talk, but um, I'll give you plenty of places to go if, if I succeed in, in interesting you. So, the world is full of middle-aged men with a bee in their bonnet and a book about it. And so it's rather important that I, I think that I start by saying, you know, where I'm coming for, from, frankly. And I have a sort of hybrid past. I was once a creature of the oil industry, and there in Bolchistan in um, 1984, in the province where Osama bin Laden was doubtless now hiding and where no Anglo American could possibly go um, safely, I explored for oil. Thankfully, unsuccessfully, but that was my first career. Um, my research was on the history of the oceans, the geological history of the oceans. In the 1980s, I became very worried about climate change when it you know, wasn't very really fashionable because of that um, appreciation I felt I had of the geological rhythms of the planet over long periods of time. And when the first concerns came out about the heat trapping ability of greenhouse gases, uh, of course, I got very worried. So. I quit that world of um, oil and teaching cannon fodder for the oil industry at Imperial College. I joined Greenpeace um, from 1989 to 1996. I worked for Greenpeace as an environmental campaigner, mostly focusing on energy issues. So then in 97, I set up um, Solar Century, which is, as some of you may know, the um, a, a downstream solar company, we design and manufacture in South Wales actually um, solar roof tiles, electric roof tiles and uh, thermal roof tiles and there you can see solar combined heat and power in the roof of Europe's first solar power street in the very sunny county of Yorkshire, <laughs> all British made, British designed products and you know on our good days these last six years we have been the UK's fastest growing energy company of any kind, not just renewable energy. <coughs> On our bad days, of course, we're still a small, struggling South London roofing company, which I think tells you everything you need to know about energy policy in the UK. So that's me, and that's where I'm coming from. And if you're a cynic, you would say, um, of course, you're going to be hyping peak oil because you want to sell more solar panels. And if you read the blog streams in the Guardian, there are countless people who say that. But if you're a, pers a person of um, a fine judgment, you will appreciate that track record. I actually set up the company because I'm worried about climate change and energy security, not the other way around. But that's a cross I have to bear. So, uh, I want to talk about the oil crisis in the context of the other two great crises of our times. I mean, you know, there are others, you can add water, you can add population, you know, this is not an exhaustive list, but I think of these as a triple crunch because they're really related. And uh, surprising as it may seem, the financial crisis is really relevant to all this. And I'm going to go through each of the three, the financial crisis, the climate crisis, and the oil crisis, looking at the two narratives that we wrestle with. Um, as, as people who are interested in these issues, or not, as the case may be, because they affect us all, not least the financial crisis. So the comforting narrative that you got from Barclays, Lehman Brothers, Goldman Sachs, all of them, uh, ahead of the crash in, 19, in 2008, was that they had somehow excised risk from the issue of complex derivatives. They had massive new assets, which of course they encouraged you, us, our pension fund managers to invest in, uh, in mortgage-backed securities. The uncomfortable part, which actually at that time really only came from a few maverick economists, albeit with Nobel Prizes, some of them, um, and far-sighted journalists like Gillian Tett at the Financial Times, who said, actually, sorry, whistle-blowing 
here I come, mortgage-backed securities can be toxic. I mean, they understated it. At one point, almost all of them became toxic. Resulting panic can stall or crash other markets. What did the incumbents do? Goldman Sachs and the rest, of course, they poured scorn on the whistleblowers. I mean, cruelly, uh, in many cases, on the stage of the World Economic Forum. And yet, what were the stakes in all this? Recession, as we have had and maybe are emerging for, or even depression, if um, the governments hadn't acted as fast as they had. Massive unemployment, still rippling forward. The current government blames the previous government, but those of us who read the financial pages know who really is to blame. Um, and it's not Captain Mannering, it's the, the people who are in the positions that Captain Mannering once occupied in the banking sector. The climate crisis, the comforting narrative is that there's uncertainty, uh, and therefore that means the absence of threat, or at least not, let's not worry yet. Uh, climate scientists are conspiring to scaremonger, and the, the American right, the American far right, I would say, have been hideously successful in their disinformation campaign around this. The uncomfortable narrative is that scientific evidence uh, for massive risk in the emission of greenhouse gas and fossil fuels is overwhelming, and we're all to blame to some degree in you know, our fossil fuel profitable lifestyles. Um, what's at stake? Environmental ruin, economic ruin. Just look at what happened in Russia this summer, the effect of the wildfires, you know, the first faint hint of what it would be like in a, a world where global warming is running away from us. Australia, the, the, the floods um, recently, and ultimately a threat to civilization. Not hyperbole. This is what many world-class climate scientists believe. Now, the oil crisis, um, we have two narratives again. 40 years of reserves left. You hear this mantra time and time again from BNP and others. There are trillions of barrels of oil left in resources. They too, like Goldman Sachs and the others, pour scorn on those of us who blow the source. Uh, and the price mechanism, the, the economists say, you know, if you're worried, the oil price will go up, and they'll go out and they'll find more oil because the oil price is high. Won't they? We'll come back to that argument. The uncomfortable narrative um, is that people who, say, who look at the flow rates and say, actually, you know what? It's not about how much you may or may not have underground, it's about how quickly you can get it out of the ground. Um, and you're not investing enough to get it out of the ground fast enough. And anyway, you've got this constant depletion. We're burning so much oil in our oil profligate, nay, um, oil addicted economies that you know, we've got to find a new Saudi Arabia of production capacity every two years. And what's at stake if we get this wrong in an oil dependent world where supply no longer matches demand? Energy crisis, the third energy crisis. There were two before in the 70s and 80s. This will be the final one because there'll be no you know, replacing the descent from the peak. Recession or depression, just like the financial crisis. And for some, maybe many, oil importing countries, that's us folks. Energy famine. Why energy famine? Because what we're talking about here is a failure, a potential failure of human groupthink. And we've seen this happen in the financial crisis. We know we're capable of it. All these smart bankers, they won't lie. They talk themselves into a state of belief that their, their groupthink worked. It didn't. It was catastrophically wrong. And our belief is the oil industry is in the same process. So most oil uh, producing countries, um, you know, entered the era of cheap oil with not much in the way of domestic infrastructure programs. And this is Dubai in, in 1990. And I'm watching to watch these three towers in the foreground here as we look at Dubai in 2007. And you see the point, you know, there are massive infrastructure programs in these oil um, exporting countries. Right now in Saudi Arabia, they're producing maybe eight and a half million barrels a day. They're burning a million and a quarter in electric power plants. That's going up at 8% every year. A uh, senior Saudi official said uh, on current, the other day, on current trends, Saudi Arabia will be burning 8 million barrels a day domestically. You see my point? 
so that if we are correct in this peak oil analysis, there will be this wave of realization, just as happened with the credit crunch, where people you know, went from one week of crikey, you know, maybe some of these mortgage-backed securities are toxic, to the next week, uh, it really looks like a few, quite a few of them might be. The week after that, the whole thing was looking toxic and the markets tanked and the international finance system froze completely. And we were days away from not being able to take cash out of the ATM machines. So it's the same story here. Um,